Hey, glad we finished the show, Bonnie and Matt. What did we talk about today? <laughs> Figured out what my two spirit animals are. Yeah. A lot of space stuff. Space facts. Space facts. Some useless space facts. Anything else? Obsession versus addiction. Obsession versus addiction. Mm-hmm. Having grace for yourself. Grace. All right. So here's what I got. There's no way to outsource your growth because shortcuts never succeed. You got to figure out how to fail small to win big. It's okay to be different because different is you. Your job to lead is to listen to their story, not write your own version. How self-security is the secret to success as a leader and entrepreneurs. The difference between addiction and obsession. Every hand you are dealt has the possibility to win as long as you play it. The secret to success is staying on the offense. You're the only one in charge of your throttle. Use it or lose it. Make patience and obsession get married with your passion. You will never be back where you were, nor do you want to. Open back doors will always hold you back from your potential results. Do you believe in magic or magnificence? To design the movie of your life, you must not believe in magic. Your relationship with celebration will dictate your chances of success. Would you be a leopard, dolphin, tiger, or dog? How the most useless fact Matt knows puts life in perspective and relieves anxiety and how self-love does not equal self-complacency. Did I miss anything? Yeah, just listen to that instead of... Could you send me those notes? I will send you those notes, but I think I should just shut up now and let's get into the episode. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Mind of George show. And I have a... I don't have one special guest, I have two special guests, and I was making my notes on how to introduce them. So I'm gonna call them the kings and queens of fitness modeling, Ah, the masters of taking photos in the buff while enjoying themselves with a little bit of plant medicine, the queen of authenticity and vulnerability and taking a stand for her whole life with the guy who picks things up, throws them really far, and has completely stayed consistent in being the master of himself in relationships to get to this point. They work together on a brand, they lead the world while loving each other, and they have two dope cats that they love to Photoshop everything on. So today, Let's welcome to the show, Matt and Bonnie. That's the best intro I've ever had. Yes. That's the best intro I've ever had. God, I gotta get better at this when I have wow. the guest on now. Now, yeah. now I have we, a new thing to be better at. We can call it. That's yeah, it. That's that it. was great. Yeah, yeah everybody Success. laughs. I swear, like in a previous life, I wanted to be Eminem, but I can't sing, I can't rap. And so I use my podcast to do like off the cuff marketing intros. That was incredible. Or, just fills my tank. There's definitely, that's, there's that's a little incredible. bit of the podcast bit, that, like the narcissism of it that like I really run into occasion. It's like, so let me get this right. I just think the conversations I have with my friends are so good that other people should pay to listen to them. <laughs> it's absolutely what it Well, is. so we don't have sponsors yet, so this is just for fun, but we're getting there. <laughs> no, I, I think it's great. So I'm stoked. So for all of you listening, if you haven't listened to the episode we dropped with that, which was one or two or three ago, um, that turned into whatever that turned into in the best possible way ever, because uh, he unlocked parts of me to share. Yeah, that and was, was fun, dope. man. It I was really appreciate that. It was amazing. It was amazing. Uh, master of holding space is what I will reference that one on. So today I want to take you guys through the official Mind of George show to keep people with like what we listen to, because you have so much to add. But I always start off with one question. And I kind of like just rip the bandaid off. And so I'm going to ask you both independently, but I'm going to ask you because we've already been on the show together. So when you think back over your career, strongman athlete, you know, playing sports your whole life, being an entrepreneur, many companies, like many seasons, what has been like the biggest lesson that you've learned, most painful one that you've had to learn to kind of carry forward in everything that you do? Ooh, yeah. Um, we just go for it. Yeah. For, for me... Like, I think luckily that I had the background in strength yeah. uh, because like one of the things I really bite, liked about strength training that clicked for me early on was uh, there's no way to outsource it. Like, and that's one of those cool things that I always felt when I started traveling and going to different places was I had this credibility because I could lift and because I was strong and that immediately translated to other strong people. They already knew that like, you know, you can't fake the time it takes to get strong. There's no way to pick up a book and skip those days and reps and years and sets. And so, like, I didn't start meeting people until I was 10 years in to lifting mm-hmm. a lot. And so that lesson is the one that I, I, I realized early on that you can't fake it. And so if I need the reps to be good at anything, let's go ahead and just get started and start making mistakes and start trying to figure out how to not make those mistakes over and over again. 
And uh, I did that with my lifting career and it's been able to pretty translate well into the rest of business and life and stuff like that. Like I'm down, let's make action, mm-hmm. but we're not scared of failure. Yeah. And so let's figure out how to fail small to keep using that as data points to set the compass on what the direction we want to go is. You know, if all of a sudden like, ah, my back's bugging me and back squats hurt, let's figure out another way around instead of just saying like, well, shit, I have to back squat on Monday. Mm -hmm. So like, maybe we try a belt squat. Maybe we can try some other options. Uh, You know, does front squats hurt? You know, we've got some other tools in the box and the same with my business. You know, instead of panicking and saying, you know, this is the thing we have to do is make this. We don't. Mm -hmm. We can pivot. We can do whatever it is that needs to be done, but be willing to change. I love it. It's almost like not being romantic about what the plan is, right? It's it's making it so you take a step forward, but then Mm -hmm. being willing to adjust it as much as needed to keep going. No gods, no heroes. Nothing sacred. Yeah. Move. No, I, I love that. I think that's something that I watch with both of you. And so Bonnie, like full disclosure, I had to go stalk you yesterday. Like I went deep and I didn't accidentally like a photo from like two years ago. So we're still <laughs> good. perfectly fine. Because I, like, ah. I was like waiting oh, no. for it to pop up. She's gonna be like, who is this? Oh, I'm gonna meet him tomorrow. Oh, you're the yeah. guy. And I'm like, I didn't mean to like it yeah. <laughs> two years ago. It would have been completely fine. <laughs> I was I, I'm impressed if you actually went back that far. Oh, I, yeah. I was like in the endless scroll. The kids were in bed and yeah. I was like, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna check it out. <laughs> oh, I watched this? your stories, your highlights. And I was like, Amazing. Ah, I love this is like my spirit animal of authenticity. Like it's great. Amazing. And Thank so you. when you've had quite a career as well in all yeah. of this, and then even recently have gone through some like crazy self guided, self chosen paths. And I yeah. imagine that that's had some resistance and stuff there. So for you kind of same question, when you look back, like on your career to get here to where you coach people, you're an amazing mm-hmm. athlete, but you've also overcome some serious adversity to keep going in this game. What do you think your biggest lesson is? I think for me, the biggest lesson just over everything the whole time has been, it's okay to be different. Mm -hmm. And I remember having, you know, I tell this story a lot because it's so significant to me is I remember having this moment with my dad and it's one of my favorite stories to tell because it was so impactful for me. I was at a friend's wedding, um, a friend from high school, and I was sitting at this table uh, with all my friends from high school and their husbands. And I wasn't with anyone at the time. So my date was my dad because he was close to that high school friend that was getting married and everything. And everyone's just sitting around the table talking about their marriages and their babies and all these things. And I'm sitting there just drinking my vodka soda, just feeling (laughs) way out of place. Right. And at one point I go up to the bar and uh, my dad's like, can I buy you a drink? And walks up to the bar with me. And I'm just like, man, I have nothing to talk to these women about anymore. Like we're just on completely different paths. And my dad looks at me, he's like, well, that's fine. You didn't want to be like these girls anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's always stuck with me. And anytime I feel like, yo, things are a little weird. This is not a normal life. I remind myself of that. Like, yo, you didn't want a normal life. Mm -hmm. You wanted everything to be completely abnormal. But at the time you just didn't really know how you were going to get there. Yeah. And I think for a lot of women, you know, in strength sports and in fitness and all that, like, it's important to remember that, like your Mm. path might not be the normal, like white picket fence path. And that's fucking great. Yeah. I am very, very glad and grateful and happy to be on this path with the amazing partner I have and, you know, all of our goals lining up and wanting the same things out of life, you know, it's been amazing. But I think just reminding yourself that like, it's okay to be different. It's okay to have these unique challenges and experiences. And this year and everything I've done this year with surgery and everything has just added to that. Like, this is your own experience. This is your own life to live. And that's beautiful. And it's exactly what it should be. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you about that surgery, but even Mm -hmm. outside of strength, like, I feel like what you just said speaks to every entrepreneur, but primarily like women entrepreneurs. Like I have so many women in my audience and you know, men and women, but I see it all the time, like follow my way or do it our way. And I was like, it's only your way. And so I, yes. I love that because mm-hmm. if there's anything I've learned is every time I've tried to do it somebody else's way, the universe yeah. just smacks me quite a yeah. bit harder every single time. Yeah. You're just not staying 100% true a to yourself. Yeah. So I have, I have a question for you on that, on like a deeper thread. So mm-hmm. I feel like you know, quote unquote, the finish line in life is awareness, right? It's this sovereign awareness Mm -hmm. of like, I get to be here, be aware of how I feel. 
But on the inverse of that, like yesterday, I had no problem sending an audio message to my CEO and I cried for like five and a half minutes. And I'm talking like violent, like, like I had to get Sobbing. it out, right? Yeah. So how do you protect that in those moments where like, it feels like there's a chink in the armor? Because mm. what I see a lot and what I've experienced is like in the Marine Corps, we used to say this all the time. They're like, leadership is lonely. And I never understood it back then, but I understand it now. It doesn't mean I'm alone. It's that it's really me, me, and me. Yes. And then once I'm complete, I can give that to the people around me. Yeah. So what are some of the things that you do to like stay grounded, stay solid mm -hmm. in like what you do, practices, anything? Yeah, it's so timely that you're asking about it now because I'm also going through some big like hormonal changes. Yeah. Oh, so uh, there's a bit of a roller coaster right now where some days everything's amazing and I feel great and I've got a lot of energy and it's good. And then there's other days where, yeah, I just need to cry yeah. and maybe sleep 12 hours. <laughs> and um, I think just giving myself... Uh, the grace to accept those days mm -hmm. and to not force it. Mm -hmm. Like, yo, if I don't have the energy today, that's okay. Yeah. Like some days it's going to be like that. And Matt's been amazing because he, he isn't afraid of those days where I'm a little off and feelings are at an all time high and I'm a little sensitive and all those emotions are just right under the surface. Um, he's, he's great. He doesn't try to change my feelings. You know, he acknowledges it okay, what can, I, what can I do for you? How can I hold space for you? What's the best way I can be a partner for you today? Um, which has been amazing. But I think it's, it's, it's that self-awareness and self-acceptance that like, it's okay. It's okay to feel these things and to not feel these things or to try to suppress them is probably going to be more damaging because you're not being true. You're not being authentic. And I think having that, that really heightened self-awareness has really been a game changer for both of us mm -hmm. to be able to say, you know, today I'm a little sensitive. Today I'm a little off. Today I don't have the energy. Whereas a couple of years ago, I don't think I was that in tune with myself mm -hmm. at all. I would just either get frustrated or angry or whatever that emotion may be instead of really internalizing and being like, okay, why? Yeah. What is the why today? Yeah. And sometimes it just might be hormones, you know? Um, but totally. if there's other things that need to be discussed, I feel like if, if you're not really that in tune with yourself, it's harder to express why you feel the way you do. Totally. So for me, that's kind of been an ongoing challenge. Mm -hmm. And I won't say that I'm an expert at self-awareness by any means, but I'm getting a lot better. There's a really, I got to say this though, because that quote, this one of my friends said this, um, and I love it because it applies to what you said. I mean, we're all students, but he said, um, an amateur says, I already know. And a master says, thanks for the reminder. Mm. And I like carry that with me like every single day because I I like I, I get into it too. Like I have those feelings and, and just full disclosure, like, I'm aware, but there's times I get so triggered or some PTSD comes back in that mm. I can't be like, hey, I'm off today. And so instead I'm like this dark cloud and it takes some feedback. And my 16 year old daughter is actually the queen of giving it to me. She has like one word that cuts through. I'm like, oh, I gotta go for a run. <laughs> yep. Yeah. My wife gives me the glare <laughs> and it works amazing at this point, but I love it. So my question for you, Matt, and because what you said is so powerful and the one thread that I wanna pull is you said, he doesn't try to change it, he's a witness to it. And I feel like in this game of entrepreneurship, like we're surrounded by like, as Matt calls them mutants, right? Yeah. Like these yes. high performers. Or at least trying to be. We're trying to be these high achievers. And I feel like most of the time I watch people in business and people with their companies, with their teams, with their staff, with their bosses, instead of being witness to them, they just try to change it. And so what are some of the things that you do to be able to like witness Bonnie where she is in whatever that is and be solid and secure to lead through that? Well. Like I'm secure enough in us, yeah. right? Like in where, where we got and what we want to do and what we're accomplishing. And I'm, a, I'm realistic enough now that the insecurity parts of relationship at 38, I'm, I'm not that concerned with um, because I, the insecurities are me panicking about things that aren't real that, A, I can't adjust. Yes. And so those things are going to happen whether or not I'm panicking about them anyway. So I may as just wait till they rear their face for me to deal with it. Yeah. And so as long as I can check in and be like, Hey, you okay today? And if she's like, I'm just off. Yeah. Yo, that's cool. You can be off as long as being off doesn't get pointed at each other. Totally. And get personal. <laughs> totally. And we're, we're still allies. And there's also nothing wrong with being like, I, I just need today. 
yeah. to be alone and quiet yeah. and not sort any of this. And now, you know, with that said, of me being able to hold space for her, um, she facilitates me being able to hold space for her very well because on those days that hormones are out or we are more needy or anything like that, we're both very respectful of what each other's job requirements are. Mm -hmm. And the freedom that we get with these jobs also means we're also never not at work. Yep. <laughs> and so I'm happy to hold space in any way, but she's aware she can't be like, I need you to lay in bed with me all day today. I'm like, I can't fucking do that. I'll fucking pull all my hair out. Yes. Right. And so she's very aware that that the, the days that I'm locked in and I have a thousand yards there, it's because I have a million things going in my head. Yeah. And she holds space for that well too. Yeah. And it, and it took a bit and it took a bit. She's a bit more empath, uh, you know, empath to my emotions mm -hmm. than I am hers. Yep. And so, like, if I'm having a rough day or I'm frustrated or I'm manic. Uh, I check on him and then I bail. Yeah, and then she's like, cool, I got to. <laughs> you do I the drive-by. I've got <laughs> to protect me. Yeah. yeah. If and, I'm around it too much, I'll just soak it all in. Yeah. yeah. And there were mm -hmm. big changes coming into this, right? Totally. Like, I mean, I left a 13-year a relationship and a marriage, and then I moved across the country to, to be in St. Louis where she was. And... You know, this went from, you know, my own ego shit mm -hmm. of like, I went from a house I designed and built that I'm very, very happy with and moved into a spare bedroom at her friend's house it was a check for me mm -hmm. and like moved in very broke yeah. because I have other responsibilities that that money has to go to right now. And that's being an adult. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, going from that to an apartment and then starting to reestablish building this life again mm -hmm. uh has been great um things don't operate at the speed <clears throat> i wish they would but that's how earth works i mean what did i say this morning i was like it'd be really great if i could just have everything operate at the speed of my ideas <laughs> yeah yeah and i said step one yeah, yeah find a team that operates on that speed right and, then and that's a, the best you can do and that's it <laughs> i feel like i've been trying to find that same thing and then i had this level of acceptance i was like Oh, it's probably not possible because it wouldn't work. No that way. No, I also couldn't afford to finance the ideas at the speed that Everyone, I have them. It's like, why do you work out in silence? I'm like, because I have to vomit these play things somewhere. Yeah. Mm. Right. Like, you know, one of the biggest things, because so on the last show, Bonnie, with Matt, I told him about my stillness practice. Like, it's my okay. number one, and I'm going to call it a weapon because it's sharp. It's my. I've done it. I've done it three days. Yeah. Since. And I can't wait to talk to you. It's like my number one weapon for myself. And also like my students, because you just sit, you have to mm -hmm. practice complete boredom. And one of the things that I did is I made a rule mat and I tried this because I would get all these ideas, right? I go for a run. I'm like, oh my God, I'm like pinky in the brain, right? I'm like, I'm ready to take over the world, right? Yes. I go hiking and I was like, I have no signal. How am I to call my fucking team? Uh. And then one of my teachers was like, if it comes across and you have to catch it, it's not an idea worth executing on. And I was like, say that again. And he's like, if you're trying to catch it, it's not baked enough. He's like, you have mm. to let it go. And here's what's nuts. This is why I've fallen in love with my stillness practice. Now I'll get flavors. And I'm like, oh, it's there again. Oh, there it is again. And once I get it for like the third time, I write it down. And oh. it's been huge for me because it's like being basically non-codependent on that every idea is the best idea to distract mm. me from the needle movers. But then knowing that like having enough trace and trust and faith in what we do that like if I just show up every day and it comes up a couple times, like I might want to pay attention to it. Yeah, that, that's interesting. an interesting, that's a really interesting way. I've never phrased it that way. Uh, I, I explain it in a way less eloquent manner. <laughs> um, for me, I, I look at it as obsession. Yeah. And so I, I feel like there's a big difference between addiction and obsession. And for me, I, I do obsession. And I'm aware enough at this point in my life that if a thing pops up and I've decided to mentally check that and put it on the vision board or whatever it is of a concept or a design or someone I want to meet or a place we want to go or a project I need to start, that if it's one of those fleeting moments, like I'm on a hike or mindfulness or any of these type of things, if it's really important, it shows back up. Yep. Thousand percent. 
But like, I know like leaving here and especially being in this universe and, and getting to hang out with Rob and seeing this incredible stuff that him and Dana have built, I'm way fired up Yeah, to go mm-hmm. back home uh, and just put things in play because it's possible. Yeah. And I have, I have proof that I got to walk around him that says this totally. is possible and I need that. Totally. Especially getting to know like the ins and outs. I need the firsthand experience for me to trust it. Yep. Because yeah. the bullshit sniff. I'm going to plant this right now. I told Brent earlier, you guys are flying me to St. Louis because I'm just going to give you three days of my time. Dude. I'm fired up about your brand. I'm super Come to St. Louis. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, and I have many, many business friends there as well. So Perfect. Yeah. I was like, nope, Perfect. this is easy. I told Brent when we walked in. I was like, I don't think I told Matt yet, but you guys are just going to fly me to St. Louis because yep. I, I need to sprinkle my unicorn <gasps> dust on some new stuff. And I was like, yeah. this is it. Dude, we would love yeah. it. And uh, yeah, I was planning to talk to you about that. Anyway, but like that obsession piece, <laughs> that's the one I know that for me, you know, I'm not talented or smart enough to make not obsession work. Yeah. I can't half-ass a thing to an existence. And that's what habit's been this far. It's doing fine. Yeah. But of course it doesn't have the rocket fuel. Totally. And for everybody listening real quick, just so you guys know, listening, um, they have hate brands, which is the clothing around the drop and then habit coffee, which we're going to sprinkle some unicorn dust yeah. on as well. Um, but yeah, and I have a question on that, on the addiction versus obsession Mm. thing. How do you break down the difference? Like what would be your distinction between them? So for me, addiction and, and, and I look at it as anything because yeah, I have plenty of vices. Yeah. You know, whether honestly, whether that's cannabis or it's, you know, psychedelics or coffee or caffeine or pornography or sex or double fisting, any of these things, right? Like I like stimulus. Mm -hmm. Uh, me uh, too. Addiction to me is when I start putting off important stuff mm. to do that. Like if I'm skipping out, like porn's a really easy one. Yeah. Um, because I'll use it as a distraction and damn near white noise yep. occasionally. And so with that, like I'm not skipping out on going to dinner with my friends so that I can do that. Yes. So there's not an addiction there. It's not slowing down my progress on business. It's not fucking up my relationship if it's ever doing those things yeah you know and that's the same with cannabis use that's the same way i'd feel with food i'm not hiding something as soon as i feel like i need to hide a thing yeah we need to fucking check that flag yeah um and that's one of the reasons i try to just be open and honest about it if i can't be then you're fucking check that Mm -hmm. yeah there's something there yeah whereas obsession i'm proud to be a lunatic about yeah (laughs) Totally. So one of the things that I think you're both kind of magical with is, is having this grace through self-awareness, which we're not really born with, right? But both of you kind of had a pivotal moment physically, right? And so Matt, you had yours and then Bonnie, you had yours. So can you, would you mind sharing? Because I know you already shared about it publicly, like kind of what you just went through. Because what I think is incredible is like when I hear you both talk, you talk about like, going from the world's number one to like, I can never do that again. And I'm completely happy in redirecting that energy and you having the identity of a woman and then having this thing in the back of your mind for 30 years. And then finally being like, you know what? Like it's my game, it's my power, I'm taking it. But it Mm -hmm. also has byproducts that affect the way that you are living your life. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So for your listeners, I was diagnosed with the BRCA1 gene, uh, the gene mutation about seven years ago. And so what that is, is it increases your risk for breast and ovarian cancer. Basically, I'm missing a gene. Um, It increases my risk for breast cancer to about 85% over time and ovarian to like 50%. Mm -hmm. Uh, My sister and I got tested because Uh, On my father's side, his mother had cancer, his older sister, he did, and his younger sister. So every adult in the family basically had cancer. So my sister and I got tested. Um, This was prior to her decision to have kids. Um, And that was a big determining factor for her. So luckily she was negative and moved forward with spawn. And I (laughs) I was not so lucky. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, had the tested positive for it. Wait, well, hold on. Did we just spawn. refer to your sister's children as spawn? Spawn. <laughs> as I'm that. sure she would as well. <laughs> that, yeah, that adds up. It's not offensive. Um, no, I think it's hilarious. Yeah. It's great. I'm very sure she would. Uh, but yeah, so I've known about seven years. And at first, there was a lot of anger. There was a lot of denial. Those typical stages of anger and 
I, I really kind of ignored it for a long time. I was still going to the doctor. I was going to my checkups. Uh, protocol is like chest MRIs, mammograms, vaginal like ultrasounds, quarterly, right? uh, Ugh. three times a year. Yeah. 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 So it's a lot. It's a yeah. lot to keep up on. And I was doing that. I was going to all my appointments, but I really wasn't vocal about it. I wasn't talking to anyone about it online. I just kind of mushed it down as this ugly thing I didn't want to look at. I wasn't ready to look at because it just pissed me off. A mm -hmm. lot of times I would just be like, well, fuck you, universe. Like, fuck you for dealing this shitty hand of cards to me. Like, mm -hmm. this, is, this isn't fair. Like, mm -hmm. this fucking sucks that I just have this thing constantly looming over me that I'm going to have to deal with someday. And I always knew that I was going to have a mastectomy. Um, I didn't really know when, but I had two or three bumps that I found in 2020. Okay. And I was, and I would go for my checkups and my mammograms and my ultrasounds and all these things. And I'm like, Oh my God, fuck this, fuck this living in fear. I'm over mm -hmm. it. Right. Let's get this surgery scheduled. I'm in a great place. Uh, emotionally, mentally, a great relationship, financially, everything is stable. This is a good time. Let's do it. So I got it on the calendar for this year. Um, surgery was in May. Yeah, it was in May. So mm -hmm. I'm eight weeks today. I'm just over eight weeks Amazing. right now. So I had a complete uh, bilateral nipple sparing mastectomy and direct to implant. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was... It was a process. It was really, really weird. I've never had any major surgeries before. Luckily, Matt's had a bunch. He could, uh, he <laughs> helped true. me, you know, he helped me kind of know what to expect and post-op and everything. Um, healing's been great. It's weird having boobs now for the first time at almost 34 years old. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting used to that. Um, <laughs> and uh, feeling just different feelings about my body. Like every day I feel like I look a little bit different and there's some days where I love it and there's some days where I'm not into it at all. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of been some ego checks along the way about just how, I've, how I view myself. Yeah. And of course the setbacks with lifting and coming back and starting to work at 40%, 45%, you know, benching and all that. Um, but I, I know that, in the grand scheme of things, this time is not a lot and I'll get back to where I was. Um, but you know, while you're in it, patience, patience is tough. And I'm glad that you said that because like you completely get, went where I was going to leave you anyways on it. Like, I feel like people ask me about my injuries and, and by the way, people like Matt and I, like we have, we do have a byproduct of us being obsessed is that we also yeah. get injured a lot and healed yep. a lot. And yes. we're like, we know what stretches, modality, yes. supplements, yep. lotions, yep. creams. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm an expert of keeping this rickety machine. Yeah. Operating. Oh yeah. Like also, the amount of duct tape on my body is <laughs> mind blowing to me. Didn't have a lot of, of experience with, uh, pain meds. Yes. So yeah. I learned what this brain does on pain meds and how I am on about like day nine. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you're not, not you anymore. Cool. Nope. And as soon as I had a little breakdown on day nine, Matt's like, hang on, what day is this of the uh, hydrocodone? Yeah, yep, game over. And I told him and he's like, okay, back to weed tomorrow. Oh yeah. I was like, those yep. those and then magical as soon as we switched, we're all good again. Those yeah. magical zombie meds, those five or 10, 325s, that's Ooh. what got me. So <laughs> yeah. they, they serve a purpose. I, I know, they do, they do. So my question for you is looking at that, like I get asked all the time, right? Like what was the hardest part of being in a wheelchair for 12 months, right? Like you're in the midst of this, right? My question for you though, is like, what's the silver lining that you found? Oh, I don't have to think about breast cancer anymore. <laughs> yeah. All that tissue's gone. Yeah. So my chances of actually getting it are now like four, 3%. So that's it. And anytime I'm getting, you know, maybe slightly frustrated with the aesthetics or anything like that, I'm like, yo, this wasn't why you did this. Like, think about the why. This is this is the reason you went through all this. And so we have an easier future, you know? So that's it. I'm able to reel myself in pretty quickly when I remind myself of that. Yeah, it's, it. it's, it's staying on the offense, right? Yeah. Like, we're going to wait for this yeah. to find us or are we going to fucking fight? Well, and I would get other people that are like, yo, there's still a 15% chance that you won't get it. I'm like, fuck that. <laughs> Fuck that 15%. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Well, it's too high. when you really start to study the brain and understand the, the distinction between our thoughts and how we manifest them, it's like, no, 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 there is no 15% because the way I think about it, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, like it's, it's my Well, and looking at my family, I'm just like, yo, these are, these are fucking ticking time bombs. Yeah. They got to go. Yep. Danger titties. Yeah. They danger gotta titties. Gotta go. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So 
I have an interesting question for you, and this 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 might get a little esoteric okay. on this one because you were talking about addiction versus obsession. I was like, I could dive deep on this with you for like mm. ten hours on like a deck conversation. But where did this thing that obsession is bad come from? Because I feel like the culture mm. that we live in post industrial revolution has created this. You're bad. But if you go mm. back pre, it's like nobody was getting upset that I was out hunting for food for 12 hours. Or no that one was, I was mad at the rock building my boom whatever. or building my boom. And so like, where do you yeah. think this like, this bad like paradigm around obsession came from? I think, <sighs> hmm. Well, because we have all those basic needs met. Oh my God, yes. Like that's, I think that's the start of it, right? I, so I now- I think that's part of it. I have time to obsess. I have time to you obsess. You have time to obsess. Now we're at the, the the tippy top of that hierarchy of needs where people are like, no, we should have balance. Yes. So then Fuck people yes. are promoting the balance when, yo, if you want to be a, a fucking mutant freak and an elite athlete or elite whatever that may be, yo, fuck balance. You yeah, can't the, have it. The greatest experiences in my life came from- I got to travel around the world and compete in a sport I love totally. with the Highland Games. I got to become a two-time world champion, and that has opened a number of doors and avenues for me to pursue a life that I did not know was a possibility beforehand. But now that I know it is, I can't pretend I don't know. And yeah. so if I look at what for me has worked with success, it's an obsession with strength sports, yeah. which... I chiseled away and eventually found a niche of one that I was very good at. Okay, you, well, won, you, you won twice. Sure, but okay, I, I, I cool. wasn't a great track and field <laughs> athlete in college. Um, I mean, because as throwers go, like, yeah. there's this thing called the Olympics you go to. If you're a really good thrower, it isn't the Highland Games. Yeah, <laughs> Highland Games, great fun. I'm not confused on the difference of those two things. Uh, I really liked strongman and I loved the training for it. And it got obsessed with that. And I mean, my garage at that point I had built. So this is 2007 or 2008 and no one makes equipment. Like no one makes yokes. No one makes logs. No one makes any of this the way Rogue does now or Sorenex or any of these other people. And so like I'm getting materials and finding friends who can weld and we're building equipment to train. And I loved it. I loved that figuring it out and making stuff and having it all at my house. So we poured Atlas stones and had a full garage run of strongman equipment at one point. And as obsession turned, the equipment went away and I moved into a different sport. And uh, I, I wasn't very good at strongman. I also didn't enjoy competing in it. I liked training and then the competitions didn't do anything for me. And I felt really similar about powerlifting and weightlifting. Um, Highland Games was everything I loved about throwing in college, but I didn't have any of the part of a team need to go to class bullshit. Mm -hmm. And so once I kind of was able to, when, when that sport was taken from me with, with the knee injury or complications from surgery, and I've got a lot of downtime. I mean, I spent in that three years from 2016 till the knee replacement in 2019, <clears throat> eight knee surgeries. There's five ACLs, a meniscectomy, a total, uh, a high tibial osteotomy, an OATS procedure. And finally, uh, I don't even count scopes. <laughs> That's the thing. Like, I don't even count those as surgeries. Cause they're How many day, of those would you have? Three. Had? There were three scopes to like so clean like, stuff out of. You, your knee's been opened up 12 times. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. About that. Um, and so, like, on the backside of that, everything that's ever worked for me well, I was obsessed with. Mm -hmm. And so, like, even I was doing well as outside sales rep with the regular job thing. And that worked really well for a long time because it was cool having a job that really paid money. Yeah. That was a first. Yeah. Because the first run at trying to do the entrepreneur thing with the bike shop, I, I had the obsession with bicycles and the maintenance of them and all that and building and all that, but I didn't have it for running a business and or really riding mm -hmm. and it never translated. Mm -hmm. um, and so if I start picking apart like what's worked and what's not worked for me over the years, like the ones that I'm obsessed with do. Mm -hmm. And so how do I get that same pointed compass toward hate brand and what I want to do with my life that that clicked over to obsession. And I think <clears throat> your regular person, and I hate using that term, right? But let's just say the people that 
work for other people and have the two weeks vacation and do the five days of work and then they get their weekend and live a more standard path of life, I think balance is important. Um, it's not for me. And it's sure shit not right now. Yeah. I, you know, I, I've got time to be balanced. Like, what else am I doing when I'm 70? If I yeah. want to fucking have balance when I'm 70, great. I only have so many years to learn how to wake surf. Yeah. I only have so totally. many years to go do these crazy adventures or go, I don't know how long my body's going to be cool with sleeping in a roof tent and, you know, <laughs> doing all this crazy yeah. stuff. And I, I love it. I, I'm, I'm obsessed with life experience. Yeah. That's the big one for me because that's the only thing I've ever responded well to and learned from is experience. It's not reading. It's not, I need hands on. I need to smell it. I need to yeah. touch it. I need to know, you know, even like the Husafell stone in Iceland, right? Yeah. Like these manhood testing stones. I got obsessed with those for a bit and I've got to do all the ones I want to do. I don't have to hold a conversation about like, Oh, the Husafell stone and people do it in training or this. And like, yeah, I put my hands on the rock. I carried it around the goat pen in fucking Iceland. Yep. I bought the ticket. I took the ride. Yep. I, I absolutely love that. So I'm going to try to tie like four thoughts in my head together <laughs> to like take this last 10 minutes and do it. So the first part was about this like thing of obsession. John Donaher, who's like one of the best martial arts coach in the world. I'm going to show you this video after the podcast. It's only like nine minutes. It'll blow your mind. He talks about how once we basically invented the tool and moved ourselves to the top of the food chain, we took meaning away because our only shared common goal was survival. And so we would wake up naturally motivated every day to get food, shelter, right. fire. But then once it's given to you, that drive was taken away. And then I watched that and I watched so many people advocate their self image to the world. Mm -hmm. To like, mm -hmm. my image is what social media thinks of me, what the news mm -hmm. say I should be, what the magazine cover has. And so there's this dissonance of like mm -hmm. who I am versus who I really am yeah. mixed with in my opinion, the meaning taken away that creates that kind of obsession is wrong because it challenges that paradigm of the core. It's like, because it's basically a pull out of your shit. Like when I'm around my friends that are successful and I'm having a down day, first it goes to like sadness, frustration, depression. And then I sit with it and it turns into a gasp that I'm like, oh, what am I gonna make my friends wrong because they did something while I was sitting on the couch watching golf, playing a game on my phone, pissed that the money didn't get deposited right. in my fucking bank account. Like, right? And like, weird, it's not just magically finding me. <laughs> and my buddy, Jim Quick, like I had him on the show. I'm like, he's like one of my dear friends, but he's got like these three things he always says that have never stuck me. He's like, you can't get upset about the results you don't have from the work you didn't do. Yeah. Never, dude. It's and, so it, simple. and it's so there. So my question for you is like, we talk about patience, right? We also mm -hmm. talk about obsession. And I'm, this is open for both of you. How do you form a complementary relationship between obsession and patience? Because like, we can be obsessed mm -hmm. about building hate brands, but mm -hmm. if we do everything right today, the delayed gratification is 24 months down the At road least. and requires patience. But then it also, in my experience, without experience, it eliminates a KPI that lets you know you're on the right track and you're kind mm -hmm. of just sitting there grinding. So what's that like for mm -hmm. either of you? Um, for me, it, it really stemmed from the time and strength training mm -hmm. because I'm used to having an injury, I'm used to there being a plateau and I know, you know, the obstacles, the way that mm -hmm. if there's this thing that I'm struggling with and I'm hitting a plateau, I need to start figuring things out to get around it. The answer just isn't a, this isn't working. You know, why isn't this working? Yo, know, take inventory and figure out, are you sleeping? Are you recovering? Are you doing, are you doing all of the essential things other than just your time in the gym? Mm -hmm. And that translates to me for the business part too. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's been plenty of times where we've sat down and looked at, you know, past drops or anything yeah. that maybe didn't perform as expected and we break it all down. You know, why didn't this work? Why didn't this, this work? Did, and just look at the data yep. yeah. and try to just trust the data and remove my emotion from it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that, also, because I'm a lunatic, be willing to say, I want to fucking make this because I want to. It's not because it's going to sell well. Yes. And so know that I can do that, but we have to be smart about it too. I can't do that and then be like, they also have to love it. Yeah, no, yeah. then your they expectations don't. have to be yeah. managed really well. I think a big piece of that for both of us has been learning to take our emotions out yeah. of it. Yeah. 
And that goes back to training and all that. You know, the, the weight on the bar doesn't have any feelings. It doesn't care how you feel about it, right? So why should you? This is just work that needs to be done. Yeah, also, why would I give a thing that doesn't give a shit about me any access to my emotions? Boom. Well, social media. Well, another one. <laughs> it's, right? a, it's, like, a great, totally. it's a great one to look and, at it and, that way. And yeah. that's the patience part, right? Because I'm used to not being able to make progress just from hammering the gym. Yep. Because I know what reaching that plateau of potential is. And then it's really a stuff of like, okay, what if I add in a cold bath? What if I start adding in giving a shit about my diet more? Mm -hmm. What if I'm recovering better at night? What if I'm getting away from my phone earlier? What if I'm doing all these type of things on the outside of the gym that can also start being these one or two percents? Mm -hmm. And when you're chasing obsession, those one and two percents are the fucking key. Yeah, I'm not picking up 10% anymore. No. It's out of the it's out of the cards. Mm -hmm. I've I've lifted too long. Yep. And I mean, along the lines of that too, like what I've always said about getting strong is really easy. Uh I mean, I really don't even give a shit what your program is. I just need you to bench squat, deadlift, and overhead press moderately heavy once a week for the next decade. Yep. It'll work. You can't even fuck it up. Yeah. That decade part though. Yeah. Yeah. And so <laughs> that's the, yeah. And, and I know that. Yeah. I know yeah. that it took me 10 years to get good mm -hmm. at throwing. Yep. So it's going to take me that long <clears throat> for me to be like, I'm okay at this business thing. And yeah. so tick tock, like start yeah. getting the reps in, start making mistakes, start figuring out what doesn't fucking work. Cause mm -hmm. I'm aware that the reps matter. Like how many people I know want to launch a podcast, start a business or want to do the YouTube thing or any of this. And their response is always the, uh, you know, we, we recorded an episode or it's this concern of perfection yep. for mm -hmm. episode one. Yep. And I always respond mm -hmm. with like, and, and it was with Brant too, when he came on board, cause he wanted every video to be perfect. Yep. And I'm, I, what I said is we produce things quickly. And so we do reps mm -hmm. to get better. Um, no matter how long you want to spend making video or podcast one or drop one or whatever it is you're doing perfect, you're so much better at video or podcast 100. Yep. So mm -hmm. let's fucking get to 100 and listen the whole way there. Yep. I have the same issues with clients. Yeah. Like powerlifting clients. They're like, oh, I'm not ready to oh, do I'm my first night, meet. I'm a fucking nightmare client. <laughs> I am a nightmare. I'm like, you have a coach, right? Oh, You're good. Oh, oh yeah. I have plenty. <laughs> no, but I'm like, I'm like, Hey, listen, I took a year off during COVID and I want to go back in the gym and I want this. So why can't I work out once, eat what I want and lose 30 pounds after one workout? Like I don't fucking understand. And they're like, George, did you just go on a nine hour hike? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I figured like if I burn 7,000 calories, that's two pounds gone. It's the way the body reacts. I was well. like, I'm just going for the fast forward. Button. Your coach must be a saint. Oh man. <laughs> I have, I, so I had to separate it. I had to separate my food and my fitness. And now they love it because they tag team me. Right. That's what I do. They my attack class. me. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like they like, they're like, oh, okay, cool. And so she'll turn down my macros. And so then he'll turn down my training and he's like, oh, well you didn't listen. So you have to train less. And I was like, you mother, huh? but I love it. Go ahead, go ahead, sorry. But it's just clients saying I'm not ready for my first meet. When yeah. will I be ready? I don't feel ready, all this stuff. And it's you, the you same exact do. situation. You never do. You'll never feel ready. Well, no. Ever. Like we, we've talked about that. And one of the things that I'm really confident in, in myself is I fucking perform when I count. Yep. Mm -hmm. And not only that, I can do it. Yep. I can flip that switch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm confident in that I'll do it because mm -hmm. from not to mention college, even if we just start there and pretend high school athletics didn't exist. Yep. I competed in track and field, which is a weird sport because yep. we compete every weekend from January to July. And so I've also doing three different events. And one of the advantage of, of the throwing that way is like, I can't stay up all day. So I have to be able to turn it on and turn it back off to conserve energy. Um, Looking back on track meets now though, it seems insane. <laughs> Crazy. It's hilarious because I did track too. Did you? Right. Okay. Yeah. I threw too. Yeah. Okay. And, and yeah. then and then that went into Highland Games. And so I mean, with that sport, I've competed a couple, probably hundred times. I'm probably two hundred competitions into that sport. So I'm really comfortable in having my name called and saying, now's the time for you to do a thing. Yeah. And I handled competition anxiety with the thought of, I mean, look, the truth of it is, I love doing this. Yeah. And how far I throw this rock or weight today 
I ain't going to make the long list of cool shit that's happened on Earth. No. Behind yeah. volcanoes and maybe yeah. like solving diseases. It's not even and, going on your tombstone. Right. Yeah. It's not, yeah, it's not even going on my fucking tombstone. Yeah. So do your fucking job. Yeah. This is the thing you train for. Now's the time to make it all work when you get the little bit of extra anxiety, which is it's fire. Mm-hmm. Fucking manage it. Yep. One of the things that I hear in everything you both say, what I think is the secret sauce is that you are fully aligned with what you are doing. Right. There's no like, I don't want to do this or I'm doing this for somebody else. Like it's a, I'm 100% heart, head and belly aligned. And if the byproduct of that means people like it, they respond to it. I win a championship. They buy my clothes. Fucking great. Fucking great. But at the end of the day, if they don't, I'm still doing what I want to do. And that alignment sounds like it's the key for a lot of everything Mm -hmm. that you do. Mm -hmm. Would you say it's the same for you, Bonnie? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think so much of that has has changed for both of us over the past year and a half. Just that increased self-awareness and really staying focused and passionate on what it is that we want out of life. And I think when you really uh, focus on that and put that energy and those vibes out there, you know, the universe rises up to meet you. Yeah. And, and one, I know we've both felt that. Yeah. And, and one of the things earlier, we were talking about obsession, right? And obviously I feel like any, like I'm just going to start calling myself a mutant for like the next month. Just, just feels good. Like I yeah. like just water call. Good. Like I feel like that. a mutant because I'm drenched from sweat from head to toe because I did legs before we did this <laughs> podcast and my body is still like at 130 heart rate right now. My whoop's going to be like, I recorded a new activity, recording a podcast. But yeah. All this caffeine is helping. Yeah, yeah. Anyone who has figured out to produce an income out of the ether Mm -hmm. is a mutant. Totally. It takes an crazy amount of whatever it is you've figured out. Whereas like younger me could very easily look at Jeff Bezos or any of this, right? And be like, blah, blah, blah. And kind of get shitty about it. Must be nice. Yeah. Like, yo, that started in a garage. Totally. Yeah. What's the scale process of doing what he did? Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Every time I have those, one of those must be nice thoughts. I'm like, oh, that's my soul telling me to get to work because Mm -hmm. my little fragile ego Mm -hmm. is a little upset right now. Yeah. So my question about obsession, right? So one thing that I think you all know, and like, I hear you say this all the time, but I feel like when people like I'm launching this business, right? I'm starting a clothing brand. Hello. By the way, you've started two of the hardest e-commerce companies in the world, (laughs) clothing and coffee. Well, at least everyone on earth has t-shirts in their closet and everybody and most coffee. people drink coffee. Totally. And yet it's still two of it's the hardest companies hard. to grow yeah. and scale. What also helps is creating one that people can't pronounce. Yes. Yeah. Which I've done a great but job. But I told him like, I love the name. Like I love, <laughs> I love the paradigm, like the shirt I'm wearing when yeah. Rob and Dana made this, like the same thing, like it's left for interpretation. Cause like I've Joy heard, Bailey. Yeah. cause Joy I've heard, Bailey. I've heard people pronounce it like Hy-Vee. And I've heard it all over. And I was like, cool, whatever you want to call it, as long as you say its name. Yeah. Like, yeah, just that's, say yeah, sure. Name. Name. Perfect. And so when we talk about obsession, like what I watch, and, and Matt, I watch you, and now Bonnie, I'm stalking you a little bit. But I think the most thing that I watch people get stuck on is like, oh, I'm obsessed. I'm going to be excited to do it every day. And mm-hmm. here's my secret. I'm excited like 10% of the time, but I'm excited about the result that's going to come mm-hmm. six months later and the 90% that I'm not. I mm-hmm. love... You know, I'm never bored. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. never going through the motions. It never feels routine. It yeah. never feels, I'm never obligated to do it. Yeah. And that, that was something that, you know, when, whenever I hit the detonate button on the old life and I'm not doing the outside sales job and I'm not doing those type of things, the realization I have is yeah, I don't have to do anything out of obligation yes. ever. I have no problem in being invited to shit and saying no. I don't want to go because it doesn't sound fun. Um, with that said, I believe there's consequences for it. And those are shit that I have to deal with as well. Yeah. But at the same time, what that means to me is if I am going to a thing, I chose it. Yeah. You didn't mm-hmm. fucking have to be here, man. So if you're going to be here, be fucking present and be part of it. Mm-hmm. Or otherwise admit you wasted your time and go home. Yeah. You don't have to be here. You don't owe anyone shit. You yep. especially don't owe them your time. Yep. And so I only want to spend it where I want to spend it. Yeah. It's the only commodity that I can't buy any more of. Time. Yeah. Time. Oh man, I'm in there now. My son's, I mean, my daughter's 16. So like, I mean, like this morning I had to drop the Jeep off. I was like, I need you to follow me. And I was like, my daughter's driving behind me. <laughs> I have like a year and a half left. And then my four-year-old, like they say, my buddy Larry who runs a good dad show who lives in St. Louis. Um, they say 80% of your one-on-one time with your kids is gone when they turn eight. Wow. And I was like, 
45% of my son and I, our alone time is already gone. Like wow. I'm like, I like last night, my wife's out of town. I'm like, hey bubs, you want to have a sleepover with daddy? He's like, yeah, I'm like, cool. Let's sleep in my room. Right? Like, I'm like, come yeah, here. Do yeah. you a Give favor. To me. Yeah. <laughs> right? And of course, like he loves it. And so, yeah, I just think it's really, really interesting. So Bonnie, for you, like, especially now, like <laughs> post-surgery, you're only eight weeks out, mm -hmm. right? How are you finding that, like, because you both carry grace really well. Like what you said, like, I'm choosing to be here. I want to do that. What does that look like with you to have patience now? Like you've mm -hmm. changed kind of your identity, your body, mm -hmm. your training. Mm -hmm. And then now you're like, okay, piece by piece testing it. And so how mm -hmm. are you navigating that? It's, it's hard not to look at it as to get back to where I was. Because oh, yes. I know there's still a big yes. chunk of that in here. Um, but even my diagnosis was the catalyst for me leaving my nine to five job. Like, so it really put into perspective quickly how precious that time is. I, I was diagnosed and I think maybe left my nine to five corporate job like a month and a half later because I wasn't feeling uh, as appreciated and just all those typical probably things when you work for someone else's dreams. Um, I decided that fuck this. I'm out. I, I'm not passionate about this. I got this diagnosis and I already feel like my clock is ticking, like regardless of how true that is, but everyone's clock is ticking, you know? Yes. And so for me, that just kind of brought it glaringly obvious to me. Um, but now, yeah, it's, it's really hard to not look at it to rebuilding to back where I was because I'm not that same person anymore. Right. Yeah. And I shouldn't be. Things yeah. have changed. Exactly. I think I have a lot more a gratitude and appreciation for my body and what she's gone through and how she's been able to heal and adapt and recover. And so goals are going to look a little bit different and yeah. that's okay. And I know there's a lot more conversations I need to have with my body because yes. she's been through some shit. Yes. Um, so I'm looking forward to doing more of that and um, just being having as much grace as I possibly can for myself. Well, yeah. it, it's a realization too of, of, you know, especially as an athlete and looking at previous maxes and old lifts and all this mm. type of stuff. And so for me to deal with it in my head, like whenever I got out of the Highland games, I started growing a beard and then I lost 60 pounds. You know, I shut that fucking door. Yep. I am not that guy anymore. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I'm not holding myself to the standards of what he did. Yep. Mm -hmm. That ghost is okay. Yep. I'm not chasing him for the next decade. Yep. That can just be a rad thing I got to do. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, what else can this thing do? Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, we talk about this. I used to coach personal development back in the day. We talk about this concept of like back doors. And I feel like I stayed stuck for so long because I was like, I'll leave them all cracked a little bit. Cracked yeah. on that business deal. Cracked on that friendship. Cracked on that uh. really shitty acquaintance. But I'm like, maybe I'll need something. And it wasn't until like, and my wife taught me this lesson. I started closing all the back doors. And I was like, fuck it, I'm here. Like there's nothing back there that like things mm. really, really started to move. I and, like that concept a lot. Yeah, and Tim Grover just released a new book. Burn the boats, man. Yeah, burn the burn the boat. And here's the thing, like in entrepreneurship, it's the only place I don't recommend people burn the boats. <laughs> yeah. But I recommend you burn the person that thinks you can go get back on the boat, right? Yeah. Like that's the secret. I think people misguide that all the time. They're like, oh, I'm quitting my nine to five. And I was like, wait, why don't you use it to fund your new dream? Well, so How yeah, I had both? what I was able to do. I had a thought about that. So I went on a, a hike. Um, Shoot, a couple months ago now, before I ended up doing this Bryce Canyon run. Yep. And that hike I went on at Berryman Trail in, in St. Louis, it's a 27 mile yeah, I know where hike. And so I was like, cool, I've got my pack, I've got my minimal overnight thing, and I'm set for it. I'll do, you know, and I really wanted to know before this 18 mile trail run I was doing, how am I going to hold up at mile seven, like hour seven? Yeah. It doesn't seem to be a good way to train for hour seven unless you do the first six. Yeah. Which is really frustrating. If we had a way <laughs> to just give me the mental development of the hour seven without bothering with the waste of yeah. the six hours. Before. I want that pill. Just give me that <laughs> pill. And so uh, I went out and I set out to do it, right? And I've got probably 30 pounds of pack on me and I ended up finishing all 27 miles in a single day and not sleeping overnight. In, so I walked for 12 and a half hours, got back to my truck and kind of the weird correlation I had was like, yes, I did finish it, but I carried a 30 pound parachute 
with me. How much faster and what a better a job and how much more efficient would this have been if I had ditched the parachute? Mm -hmm. And at some point, you have to do that you do. to go forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, that, that's been really good that sometimes you just have to take the leap. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. I, I mean, I, I completely agree. Like one of the things for me that I find too is like, I don't know about you guys, but you talked about social media earlier, right? Like consuming our brains, taking up real estate. It's funny, it's like I deleted social media for three years, like it was gone. And now my team runs it. Like the only thing I do is like I send him stupid videos on yeah, Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're pretty funny, I, I think so. I like, fuck, I'll take happy videos. I was like, I added time. Matt to my like Rolodex of stupid Perfect. shit I come yeah. across, right? Um, but even now I still find like this itch in me, right? Like if I'm sitting on the couch, like my stillness practice is hard. I'm like, I'm feeling like inadequate or boom. And I don't know about you or both of you as like athletes, but for me, it's almost like I have to like sweat out that tolerance to get to the after point. Cause like the other day mm -hmm. I was like, Saturdays are like my long cardio days and they're for me to go into the dark, dark places, right? Sure. Like I work out in silence. And so I'm like, all right, cool. I'm going to walk on the treadmill at an incline for 10 miles. And I'm going to sit in the sauna for an hour. And the sauna was 175 that day. It was the hottest it's been in, in wow. a while. And I was in like five minute chunks. And I was like getting out, getting in, getting out. And then at the end though, I remember I laid on the concrete and I just felt so at peace. And I laid there. I ended up laying on the concrete in the middle of the gym outside the sauna for like 40 minutes. I had three people check on me. <laughs> Sir, are you okay? I'm like, it depends. <laughs> I'm in like pure bliss and heaven and presence oh, wow. right now. Um, but it's one of those things that I, I mentioned earlier, when you mentioned it earlier and, and you were talking about it, like social media being one of those things when you talk about like these things that we can control and these non-negotiables, right? And you have clients and there's things here and we compare and we compare and we compare. But I watch people compare themselves to somebody's after state in a moment, right? They're like, look, and I was like, yeah, but seven hours today, like that dude, like hit macros, got a massage, like did ART, like went on a cardio right. run, stretched in the morning, did blank. And he's done that every day for six years. And now he looks like that. And I watch people compare their before states to people's after states and they get frustrated mm -hmm. that they're not there. Well, you know, people, people really, really want to believe in magic. Yes. And, and we, we've talked about that quite a bit. That is the um, best way I've ever heard that put. So the, it, this hit me uh, on, a, on a mushroom trip in my basement. Um, we were watching Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Oh, classic, right? Yes. And the scene that hit me was, there's a scene where they're at the beach and Paul Rudd's running the tiki booth with the surfing lessons. And Jason I just watched Siegel's, this movie like a week ago. Yeah, Jason my Siegel, daughter watched it. Yeah, Jason Siegel walks up and he's like, uh, he wants to take surfing lessons. And Paul Rudd like gives him some silly island name and he's, you know, says this, you got a lot of sadness in your eyes. And he's like, oh, you know, a uh, rough breakup. And he's like, you know, it's good for that. Weed. And then he asks, and he's like, do you have any? And he's like, no. And he's like, well, let's go surfing then. Like, that's the next best thing. And I find that line to be, it's delivered well. It's perfect. It's a great mo moment in that film. And I can see someone looking at that and saying, fucking Paul Rudd's magic. Yeah. Which he is. Yep. But... The reality of that is because I have competency in filming things and understand a bit about movies and all that. That's the person who did a scouting for location because that building doesn't exist in the real world. Nope. Their wardrobes are not real. That's someone made a choice. The lighting was a choice. The way Paul Rudd can deliver that line probably 15 times on set in various ways to try to get an emotion across. Yep. The way Jason Siegel handles it the camera cuts, whoever in the editing bay decided to pick that take yep. and line it up. Whoever in the writing room got that line whittled down by the fifth attempt of trying to redo it. You know, it's not magic. It's 40 people who give a fuck. Yep. And so if you want to undercut hard work by magic, you're only hurting you. Be able to look at it as what it really is. Like, that's why, that's why everyone wants to be like, oh, steroids. <laughs> if I just did that, and let me be honest, as, as a guy who's been open to taking anything possible that makes me a better functioning, more optimized human, you know, according to the rules at play, you know, Highland Games is a drug tested sport, so I play by said rules. Yeah. I don't have a moral obligation against it. I don't give a shit what people do. Yeah. Um, 
but it's easy to look at someone's success and think the difference is they, they have magic. They don't have any fucking magic. Mm -hmm. There isn't any out there because if it existed, I would have fucking found it. And I would, and I would have paid it. for it. Yes, yeah. I would absolutely be paying for it. I'm like, we know everybody. If somebody had this magic, we would be taking it. Right. Yeah, it's you like know, it, limitless. Yeah, if there were drugs that I, if there was a pill I could take that would make me look the way Mike Rashid looks. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Game on. How much money? Would yeah. you like me to send? Game on. I, I'd take it. I'm like yeah. trying to figure I'd out take that pill. how I manifested like eternal dad bod, but I'm okay with it because my <laughs> wife and kids love me. Manifest. And I was like, there's like one time when I had like an eight pack with veins in it. I was like doing three a days eating <laughs> keto, yeah. paleo, and a competitive CrossFitter with adrenal fatigue. And then I died for like two years, right? So I'm like, <laughs> no, that's just not sustainable. Like, no. Nope. dead for two years. No. I was like, I just have built in life preservers and I'm game oh. for it right Dude, now. My, my weight loss goals. Yeah. I'd like to lose a pound a year. Yeah. Forever. It's, it's so interesting. Like now, like you and I are the, you were that, you and I are the same age, right? Yeah. And like I've been on this, like the heaviest I've ever been was 257. I'm only five, eight. And that was when I was in the wheelchair for 12 months, right? But then the lightest I've ever been was out of boot camp. I was like 151 and I looked like fucking skeletal. I was, wow. I went into high school at like 170 and I graduated high school at 270. Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, the biggest I, I've ever been is like 318. Oh my goodness. I did That's not how everyone's it. high school goes. Yeah. No one, no one puts on two pounds a month for four years. No. Ooh. All right. So I have a, I have a kind of a fun question because I, I believe that, and I feel like you both have this because of your level of grace and self-awareness, but I feel, I feel we believe that like one of the secrets to winning is celebrating all of them, like mm. having a platonic but healthy relationship with wins. And so I just want to know from each of you, like when you look back at your life, your careers, like to get here, like what's one of those like biggest defining moments or wins that like you are incredibly proud of that you've achieved? Mm. Having the courage to walk away from my nine to five. Yeah. For sure. Oh, that's a big one. For sure. I'm sure a lot of people feel that way, but for me, that was a very, very defining moment. Yeah. Um, that would have been really out of character for anyone in my family, any of my friends at the time. Uh, so it was a really, really bold, big decision to make. And I didn't put a lot of thought into it. Um, I do pretty well when I jump and have to catch myself. Uh, same thing, like moving to St. Louis, like that was like an overnight decision. Um, but yeah, leaving my job, that would be my big one because that just took me on a completely different trajectory than the one I was on. Yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, hmm. you got uh, a few. Uh, yeah. Oddly enough, like biggest wins. I mean, for sure, both world championships. Totally. Uh, the first one was rad because yeah, I fucking wanted it. Yeah. And like the year before I'd kind of just got thrown into the professional world championships at the end of the year as I had won an amateur world championship. And that was supposed to get me an automatic invite to 2012's world championship. Okay. I was like, sweet. I have a full fucking pro season to get ready. <laughs> and instead they're like, oh, uh, you're at worlds in two weeks. I'm like sick. <laughs> and so I went and, and, and competed very, very well. And I took second at my first professional game, which was a world championship. And from that point, like I, there was a difference because I, when I went into that game, I knew I don't have anything to lose. I'm not supposed to perform well. I'm not even fucking supposed to be here. So let it rip, mm -hmm. show them. Um, and then when I won the following year, like it all worked. Like I'd wrote a book about how to train for a proper season and do all this. And it all fucking added up, man. And I won by half a point, it came down to a single throw, like that throw that's a big one. It was a stone throw, uh, in the open stone. I'm sitting in third behind Sebastian went to Lucas went to these two Polish brothers who are really good shot putters. And the guy that I'm in major competition with Dan and at the time, Mike Bukowski are right behind me. So I need to win this event to get the point gap between them. So I can put Sebastian and Lucas in the points between us to give me some, some breathing room. Last throw, world championships got it i put four feet on my previous two throws hmm. through a pr and a field record and fucking did it right and then that was a big moment of like i trust me i can do it like i can turn off that feeling of panic with anxiety and i can just use that fire as fuel mm -hmm. um the other one was 2014 winning that world championship so that was the year my my dad had passed away in uh, April. And so that was just a, 
big year to begin with. And like, I didn't miss any competitions that year. I didn't change anything. I didn't let go of what I had control over. Mm -hmm. Um, it ain't bringing him back. Mm -hmm. So winning that one in Scotland again, by half a point, like that one came down heavyweight for distance. It actually came down to the last event of the day. And uh, myself and the guy, like Dan, the other guy I was competing against, um, were head to head, basically, with half a point between us going into the last event. So now it's essentially a duel. Like, all I have to do is out throw you and I win this. Mm -hmm. I don't care how anyone else does. Mm -hmm. And like in that moment, I just remember nothing else is there. It was just that. And I remember having that feeling inside of like, you'll have to fucking bleed for it today if you want it. Yep. Because I'm willing. Yeah. And it hit. And then the rest of it, like with dad passing and yeah. still getting it done on a year that would have been an easy excuse of why I didn't. Yeah. When I feel like the magic in what you just shared isn't like, you might be like, you might have to bleed for this, but you weren't competing against anybody. You no, know, if, if you're going to beat me. I can take a loss by being beat by someone better. Yeah. But I'm showing up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, um, you know, it's funny. It's like the fights for the other night and all this stuff, but I, I'm obsessed. I get obsessed with books, like winning by Tim Grover, like has my obsession right now because he was Kobe's coach and Michael Jordan's sure. coach. And one of the beautiful things, and this kind of ties into what we talked about earlier, like where I wouldn't want to go back and be the person I was back mm -hmm. then because I have different lessons and different experiences. Right. And Tim's like, here's the relationship with winning. Once you win, you have to find the darkness again, but it's a deeper darkness to keep the win. Like mm. winning is fleeting. Success is fleeting. Achievements are fleeting. Like, and what I love about both of you that I feel like you embody, and this might just be like a fill your bucket thing is that you just embody like what you can control. Like, oh, I won yesterday, but that doesn't, win doesn't carry over till today. Not at all. Right. You're like, like so I got to wake up and win again. Mm -hmm. I got to wake up and choose. And it. you were asking about like celebrating victories, yeah, right? Totally. To me, that's the thing that comes after the victory. Yeah. Of like, woohoo, feet up, vacation, celebration, right? It's never that. Nope. It's never that because I love the getting there. I like the process. I like the problem solving. I like, I love the way my brand operates because we drop weekly. And so I have a weekly test and I have long term goals. Yep. And so I constantly have feedback are we doing right? Or do they not like it? Yep. And it doesn't do me any benefit to be like, we'll make a thing. And if it doesn't perform for me to go, fuck, it's the algorithm or we're <laughs> not getting this or any of this shit. Like, yo, I made a thing they don't want. Yep. That's the answer. Yeah. Because when I make shit they like, it sells out. Yep. So figure out how to make cooler shit. Yeah. The problem's me. Yeah. And I have gotten them a little bit better at celebrating though. Yeah. Well, I think, <laughs> I think the thing for me is like an entrepreneur, like one of my weaknesses is like, my first product in entrepreneurship made a million dollars, right? So I went from a Marine to this. And then by the way, I lost it. And it took me seven years to get another one. And then once I learned the lessons, they, it just started coming. Like now mm -hmm. it's like, okay, cool. But it was like, I was wearing my varsity letter jacket yeah. from my freshman year as a 38 year old dad bod with my kids at the rodeo. Like dad I'll bod. smoke you in football. <laughs> like, no. And, and it's interesting. Cause like, I've had to go through this like relationship with myself with like winning and I realized the parts where I was codependent on winning because I was borrowing some of my value and worth from it. Mm -hmm. And then where my worth and value was no longer coming from winning, but it was leaving me empty to where I had to love the process and who I was becoming in the process. Like well, the it sounds wins, so cliche, but it's important. It's so important. Mm -hmm. Like it's so simple too. Like mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the times, like I laugh at myself because I was like, God, I like was struggled, depressed, compensating for six years. And this is really, really simple. Mm -hmm. Right. Like it's really, really simple, which yeah, I love. And that's what I ran into with habit. I really expected because hate worked mm -hmm. and you know, it'll be tough to continue to grow, yeah. but, it, but it worked. Yeah. I mean, we, we grew very quickly. We were doing a million dollars in sales in three years. Oh yeah. Oh, it's uh, going to grow quick. I promise. And then habit, I just figured I was like easy. As long as I promote this yes. thing. Yes. Yeah. No, I'm not even fucking close. That's it's coffee. No, it gives a shit. And so I'm like, okay, I need to refocus. And, and this week's helped a ton. Like after our conversation the other day, I have, I've got some new ideas and some interesting ways to go about building that relationship and trust with my customers that I don't have in that avenue. Yeah. I, um, um, I love it. And, and that's what it is, right? Like I love the win because the win tells me the plan was correct. Yeah. 
And that's, that's the thing I'm more excited about is being able to refine my process, not the singular moment of success. Yeah, the win's like a validation, but also a benchmark. Yo, it's just telling me that we were going the right direction. Yeah, like right. you're like, oh, okay, cool, waypoint in, right? Now I start from this point on, but I don't live here, right? Like there's this next mile no. marker, the next mm -hmm. mile marker. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna ask you a fun question. So I stole this, uh, Wendy asked me this question on an interview. I, I swear to God, I've been interviewed over 2000 times. This is my favorite question. All right. Okay, so Bonnie, you're gonna answer it first though. Okay. Okay, so if you could combine two animals to be your spirit animal, what would they be and why? Oh, man. Yeah, right. Okay, so we kind of talk about this a lot, like what animals you'd want to be reincarnated as. Yeah. But I feel like that's a little bit different than spirit animals. Yeah, so like uh, I'll tell you, I chose mm. a bald eagle and an orca whale. Okay, my initial instinct is to do sky water. That's what I did. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, an orca. But I'm not going to lead you anymore. I'm going to leave yeah. this one yeah. for you. I have to pick some type of cat. Maybe a leopard. Okay. A leopard and a dolphin. I have to do something in the ocean. And then why? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Leopard. Because I'm so in tune with cats. And they're my favorite animals. Love it. So I'm just connected in that way. Cool. And then the ocean is deep, dark, scary, and mysterious. And I'd want to be an animal that's comfortable down there. I love it. I love it. I love how when you said cat, like you embodied it, like, like your whole demeanor, of like course. changed. You have, I have to choose a cat, yeah. at least part of it. I love it. And then, um, yeah, cause I'm super afraid of the ocean yeah. and deep dark water and what's down there. We don't fucking know. Yep. So if I'm an animal that's comfortable down there, that would be rad. I love it. Yeah. All right, Matt. All right. So <laughs> I've, I've always thought about one. Having a second one is- That's what got me was yeah. the second one. So the first yeah. one, the one I always go to is the tiger. Yep. Just because I can't think of a gnarlier avatar to get to be than a 900 pound cat yep. that can jump 20 feet in the air. Right. Like what right. the fuck? Yep. It's an the incredible physical creature. ability. Yep. Yeah. Plus just like, you know, the confidence that would come with those abilities is so gnarly. Totally. The other one, if I'm going to think about it, would have to be my previous dog, uh, Bo, my lab. Mm. Just a perfect lab, right? Like, you know, he's not stressed out. Like, the thing we joke about quite a bit, like, with having a lunatic brain and having this type of drive, right, is like, man, if I could flip a switch to catch up <laughs> on, like, 20 hours of sleep in a 48-hour window of a weekend... But also never have anxiety about that I'm not doing shit. Yeah. Which my dog seems to be able to manage really well. Totally. <laughs> We're like, oh, I just got up from that nap. I may as well find the couch and try another one. Yep. <laughs> and, <laughs> and your cats. Yeah. Yeah, same, same, right? Same. But I would like the tiger ability and I would love to be able to have that place to go to. Like, I just want a freaky Friday, like once a month. Yeah. Yeah. With my dog and just really, this is great. I lay here. Yeah. And just stoked on everything going on during the day. Like, this is great. Okay. That's great too. And yeah. then like, <laughs> move oh, I can't on. wait for you to come to St. Louis and meet Ollie. Yeah. Cause I, uh, he's a great. special little dude. My totem after Rhythmia is a black jaguar. Um, ah. but and dude, this how is, special are the dogs there? This is a, oh my God. Aquila and uh, yeah. This is a whole different podcast, but like I, I'm on one of my plant medicine journeys. Like I had to willingly choose death. And it wow. just for anybody listening, if you've never done plant medicine, um, it's responsible for basically healing my PTSD and stopping me from offing myself. But um, it was so powerful because like, I didn't know it was an experience. I didn't know it was a ceremony. Like when I was in that moment, there was no like, oh, I'm choosing this on some experience and I'm gonna wake up and it says like, no. And I actually, <clears throat> I had to bury myself in my father's grave. Um, and I mean, like it was real, like I felt the dirt, I felt all of it. And, and the, the part, and I've never talked about this on the show either. Um, I'm a namesake for my father's brother. So my name's already on the headstone, George Edward Bryant, the year he was born, the year he was dead. And so that came to me. And then it was one of the scariest, craziest, like most intense experiences in my life. And I buried him in his grave, myself in his grave. And then it was like darkness for what felt like eight hours. Now, now would you call that like the ego death? Yeah. So see, I don't, I don't, I've never had that with psychedelics. I, you know what? I had a, a, a quote unquote ego death before, um, that I thought was, and I was like, I've had it. And then 
a trip later, like seven months later, this rocked me. I and feel like if I can say, I don't think I've had it. Yeah. Chances and we are. Have it. And, um, and then it was nuts and, and <laughs> get ready to laugh. Um, and you know, Brad, <laughs> um, I woke up and came to, and I came to, and I was on all fours, like hands and knees. And I literally was like a baby Jaguar, like a Whoa. baby Jaguar. And then Whoa. Brad walked over to me and they brought the wider brush and everything else to clear me. Cause they like saw what was happening. I purged for a while <laughs> and I started purring, no joke. And so he puts his hand on my back. I nestle my arm on his forearm and I start licking him like a cat and I'm Whoa. purring like, and then the lesson I got is that you have a lot to learn. This is just the beginning. Like you're a baby and it's like find mm. teachers, like yeah, find kidding. the right people, find the right everything. And it's hilarious. And she'll appreciate this. Every time yeah. I go back or a week later or three weeks later, I walk by him and everyone walks by me and they'll be like, nice. And I was like, oh, but yeah, it's mm-hmm. interesting because when somebody asked me that question, I said a bald eagle and an orca. And I had like this metaphysical, like the king of the sky and the king yeah, of the ocean yeah. who can help a human, but kill a shark and like, it was, it was like the same deep. And I was like, ah, oh, it's such a good question. Yeah. That's that is a, a good really question. question. Wow, so if you, you're a baby if, Jaguar. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it's nuts. Wow. My wife laughs at me now because like, it. it's. I love it. Yeah. And I had, and you, you know, like on the property, there's a Jaguar. Yeah. And literally what's nuts. <laughs> I've never talked about this. I crawled out of the Maloka on my hands and knees. <laughs> yeah. Because I had a vision of it outside and it was going to meet me head to head. Like touch my head to my head. And so if you're, you've been to Rhythmia, mm-hmm. if you walk out the door and you go left, not right to where the office is, but left, there's that rock. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I climbed up on the rock at a cat stance and I howled at the moon for like a half an hour. Uh, incredible. No joke. Oh, like, I wish we would have been there at the same time. Like the next Man. day. And I yeah. was like, yep, I'm here for it. Like, and I like had this unapologetic acceptance of myself. Oh, heck yeah. And it was kind of like this hilarious thing, but yeah. Well, I think that's one of the beautiful parts of it. Like yeah. the next morning at breakfast, everyone has that kind of energy. Like, yo, whatever happened to you last night yeah. is beautiful. And it's exactly what was supposed to happen to that's you. That's why I love Jerry. Like what they've done. Right. And, incredible. And, and I think, I do believe the actual medicine yes. is super valuable. A thousand percent. But going somewhere that everyone is committed yep. and into whatever kooky shit yep. is going to happen. Because but I, I love all this, but I can't pretend it's not kooky. Yeah, no, it's kooky. It's well, fucking and- kook as fuck. Yeah. And I love that side of it too, but I also need the side that's full sledgehammer. Totally. In my life. Like yep. I can't full commit oh, yeah. to just kook. I can't kook. like live woo. No. I need to like go on an eight mile death hike up yeah. the mountain too and be like, pick things up, put them down yeah, and, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then go be woo. Yeah. Like that's my it's harmony. It's kind of an interesting balance yeah. to find. Yeah. I think both of us have, have looked at it and you've, I, I think I remember the one conversation we were talking about Aubrey and like he says about his pants and maybe long necklaces. I'm just like, I love Aubrey's vibe, but yeah. I don't think it's my vibe. Yeah. No, no, no. Right. Like. I, it, it's, I'm, I'm so fortunate with relationships, man, yeah. that, that I have these different, as I consider my friends, whether that's Rob or Kelly Starrett or Mark Bell or Aubrey or any of these high powered mutants, Steffi and Hayden with yeah. hybrid down there that, you know, they're universe creators. Yeah. They've created a thing out of the ether that everything's branded. Everything's got a purpose. The details mattered. They wanted it this way because that's what they want to be surrounded by, want to be, and they have fucking manifest, manifested it out of the ether. Yep. There's no playbook. And so I love that I know various universe creators that do it very differently. Yeah. And I love what Aubrey built. Yeah. And I love what Rob's built. Yeah. But those are very different universes. Yeah. Totally. And I love that I'm, that I get to explore both. Because I don't know how many other universe creators travel to other people's. Yeah. I, yeah, those are very different worlds, and we operate somewhere. But no, you know what's funny? But it's also our own. If I had to design, if I had to like describe visually what you did, is like, so for those listening, we're recording this. We took over Rob and Dana's office at Flagner yeah. Fail. So we're recording this in their office. But you have like on it on one side of the rainbow, and you have Flagner Fail on the other side. You guys are the rainbow that connects them. Yes. Mm. Like, I'm so love, into that. I love that you have like the quality of the brand, the high touch point of the brand, the exclusivity of the brand, the 
the meaning and the interpretation left up for the name, but yet you also go, it's not just black or white or yellow. You're like every color of the rainbow, I will wear rash guards with short shorts and booty shorts with no yep. shirt. And then you put them together. And I was like, you add the playful personality. Mm -hmm. I fucking love it. I think, I think I that's it. something that we've always called like being in on the joke. Yeah. And Highland Games did a really good job of that for me and, and track as well, especially as a thrower. No one gives a shit about us. No. <laughs> I'm doing a thing that's important enough that my school's paid for. Yeah. Yet the stands over here lead me to believe that no one gives a fuck. No one gives a fuck. I'm very in on the idea that like, man, I hope the football team does well because we get cooler gear next yeah, year with right. them winning nationals. <laughs> yeah. When LSU won a national championship whenever we were there, like we won 11 on the track. And that doesn't move the needle very much. No, but they funded you for the next of course, couple of years. Of course. They're like, we have to spend money. Otherwise, we have to give it back to Uncle Sam. I don't know. So um, being in on the joke a little bit that no one gives a shit yep. about my goals other than me. Yeah. So make sure that they matter to me. Yep. That, mm -hmm. that, I got that one early. Yeah. Thanks for that coaching point. I needed that reminder today. Yeah. yeah that was good. So I have a question, Bonnie. Yeah. If you had to pick a theme song for Matt, what oh, would it be? Oh, man. Starman. Ah, yeah. Star well, Bowie? It's got to be Bowie. Yeah, I can see that. And we listened to it this morning, so it's fresh. Yeah. <laughs> got it. Do love Bowie. Got it. Yeah. What about for Bonnie? Oh, man. Um, immediately started thinking about it as soon as you asked her to. I know, I know you did. I gave of you course. that. Um, yours goes far more into like scene and metal for me. And so whether it's probably something off of Alkaline Trio's God Damn It album. It's got to be Alkaline Trio. Um, but there's a difference in like what song reminds me of Bonnie. Yeah. And what Bonnie should walk out. Got it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so me trying to figure out like what's a hype song that gets her to is like. But he didn't say hype song. Sure. But it's theme song. Sure. And. <sighs> Yours goes so back and forth on like hip hop. Right now, the theme song that I really like you having is that uh, is Tribe Called Red. Mm. I'm gonna have to listen to these. Ooh, mm -hmm. Tribe Called Red's a good one. Mm -hmm. That one, like that, and like the one with the two girls. That that song. Yeah, sisters. Yeah, the sister yeah. song. Rich. Oh, yeah. And like, okay, I watch you change when it comes on. Mm. I have a few like that too. Yeah. People are shocked when I whip my playlist out though. And they're like, I was like, oh yeah, no, like this is like woo-woo. Like that's nice. where oh. that's where I'm woo. Like I'm listening to like Icaros at the gym. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'll, my variety in the gym. It's mind blowing to me. That's <laughs> one thing that changed dramatically for us that yeah, hasn't gone back nope. post Aya. Nope. Music, completely yeah. different. Well, here's what I tell people. And like, I pushed this for years. So I told Matt on the other show, I made a rule after I started psychedelics, I had a big breakthrough that I was basically allowing the world to program who I became. And yet I was unhappy that I was incongruent. So I stopped mm. consuming content. That meant no music, no audio books, no YouTube videos, nothing. No wow. media. Nothing. I so how, he said for how long is this? 30 minutes a week max. And I did it for a year. Okay. And here's what's nuts. The amount of creation that came out of it was like mind blowing. Podcasts, writing, posts, thoughts. Okay. But there was some darkness that came with it well, as well. Well, if you give that manic brain, like, we're not going to give you distraction. <laughs> totally. Fuck. Yeah. The energy's got to get out. Oh, man. And it was like, and if I didn't have an outlet, it got worse. Because it was like, if you didn't release it, it became toxic from the inside. So I've, Did I've you start with, with a half hour? Or did huh? you work up to it? No, I, I'm a cold turkey guy. Okay. Like, I'm a dead cold turkey guy like him and i are the same yep. and it's like hey no like titration doesn't work for me it's like we're either in or we're out yeah mm -hmm. um and there was a you know it's funny is like i went through like when you like work out for the first time you start losing weight or you hit your goals you have that like 30 day like yeah and then i had like the 90 day slump and it was like <clears throat> that's where my shadow work really like took over like mm -hmm. being able to really sit yeah. with like because then it was like, I started to see every day the 400 times I wanted to willingly distract myself from what I said I wanted. And then I had to sit with it God, because I mm -hmm. didn't do it. Mm -hmm. And it was great. And then it went to, oh, well, now you can choose something different. But I had to really, really sit with it. It was a, it was a deep, deep thing. And I'm so grateful that I did it because then when I came back, I was like, 
yeah, like I wonder why I'm unhappy when I'm listening to country songs about my dog dying and how my wife cheated on me or like bitches and hoes and boo. And I wonder why I'm being disrespectful and I'm not being present. I was like, oh. Yeah. And it, it was it was huge. It was huge. But yeah, it was wow. it was a challenge for sure. That that one that that I'm I'm distracting from the where I wanna be. Yeah. Hmm. yeah do you, but do you think there's some validity in <laughs> In figuring out how to downregulate, thousand percent. You know, because like I, I, I get a ton out of like a lot of concepts for the brand. Uh, everything I get out of music and movies. Yep, movies are a really big one for me because I really like director yep. choice. I love what they try to. They're building a universe. Yep, and really fucking good directors care about the details. Yep, and that's why I love the Wes Anderson or Quentin Tarantino or any of these guys because. All of it matters. You know, that Tarantino has his own pack of cigarettes, the candy apple cigarettes that, that work their way through all of the films, or that, you know, Vincent Vega from Pulp Fiction has the same last name as Michael Madsen's character in Reservoir Dogs because they're technically related. Uh, there's all of these things that make the universe work, which means he fucking cares. Yep. Mm. Whereas I know other movies I can be entertained by. Yep that don't have that level of depth. Yeah. But I see that skip on the depth very quickly and I have to shift to like, yep. okay, so this is just a surface yep. totally. laugh at it. Totally. I think it's the integrity of the intention. And that's mm. what it gave me, right? Because like I would justify to my wife, like I'd be in the office, right? And she's like, what are you doing? Like I'm working. Well, I'm watching YouTube videos, looking for quote unquote inspiration, mm. right? And so it's the integrity of the intention because now like I very intentionally listen to audiobooks. I very intentionally listen to music, but it's funny because I'll be in the car with my daughter and she'll put my, my daughter's got the best taste in music. She was born in the wrong decade, right? She's a twenties, thirties jazz kind of kid. Like she's playing Pink Floyd and the Beatles and like songs I've never even heard of, but like I'll jump in with somebody else and I'll, I'm like, Hey, you mind if we just like listen to something else or I'll put my headphones in Yeah, because it feels toxic to me now. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's the intentionality because like as in the masculine, we have to off gas. We need the numb, um, but it's the intention. Like now I'll be like, hey, I'm going to watch golf for an hour just to watch it. Or I'm going to open this game on my phone to rip out 30 minutes of just like letting my brain release. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. I, for me, what it gave me was the perspective of how unintentional I was being and how upset at the results I was getting, even though I was choosing it. Damn it. And I so what it one. collapsed is it collapsed that dissonance of like, oh, this is happening. But like we talk about, there's nowhere to hide, right? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden that was collapsed. It's like, well, no shit. Well, yeah. Like if I think about, you know, a, a, a question I've really liked coming up with a better answer for is that, you know, who inspires you question. Mm -hmm. And I, I heard an answer and I don't, I wish I knew where I heard it to give it the credit. But the guy said, me in five years. Yeah. I'm doing yeah, everything I, I can to set him up. And I'm like, fuck yeah. Yeah. Totally. And so if I look at that and I deconstruct it to where I want to be in five years, if I wasted half as much time on bullshit, am I helping that guy get there or hurting him? And yeah. of course I'm helping him. Totally. So like, I should probably figure out how to manage that a little bit better. And then because like I'm the marketer, right? So I can't untie things together. We talk about grace. The biggest breakthrough for me in any of that was having grace at where I was without judging it. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So the perspective of like, I can't have fault, blame, guilt, or shame and expect a positive result. So then I had to learn how to have grace when I did overconsume, when I found myself in the YouTube hole, when I mm -hmm. found myself distracting, instead of being like, oh, you're so bad and wrong. It's like, oh, it's okay. what's underneath this? Do better. <laughs> like, why are you doing? What are you trying not mm -hmm. to feel? Like one of my favorite questions, one of my teachers asked me, what are you pretending not to know? And I was mm. like, oh, and like, that's great. Not? That comes up all the time that's for me. That's a good one. And so like, I love like the extremes, right? Like I, when I, when I started cold therapy, I couldn't just do ice baths. I was like, I'm going to do ice baths. I'm going to cut out caffeine for six months. I'm going to wake up at 4am and have a YouTube video recorded and posted by seven by the time my CrossFit workout's done. And I did it for 30 days. Yeah. Of course I did. Right. <laughs> and then it was like, okay, this is not sustainable, but I'm glad I did it. And so that's just kind of how I play, but yeah, I, I love it. So I'm going to hit you guys with some rapid fires All before right. we wrap the episode. So um, I had a question for you. Oh, ask and, me uh, before we do this. I, it's spaced on me a bit, but when it'll, you come, it'll come back it. around. Yeah. Okay. If it's important, it'll come back. Bonnie, mm -hmm. what is the most useless fact that you know? <gasps> oh my God. 
This is a question for him. He knows tons of useless facts. Most useless? Jesus. Most useless? <laughs> Ask Matt. I'm thinking. All right, the Matt. Most useless fact I know. Um, one of the ones I think about a lot <laughs> is the size of the galaxy. Yeah. And so I use that as a way to eliminate anxiety. Yeah. Um, to like... The Challenger satellite that we sent out in the 70s, which has now been cruising for 50 years, and we've and within the last five years, we got photos back looking toward our galaxy from Pluto, right? So we're, we're, we're leaving our solar system. We're leaving our subdivision. Okay. It's been traveling at between 18 and 25,000 miles an hour for 50 years, right? And it's now leaving our subdivision. Um, it's 11 light hours from us for it to continue at the pace that it's on till it hits the next thing that matters in the universe, like our next neighbor, which would be like the Andromeda galaxy or the Andromeda uh, system. It has to continue at the pace it's traveling for the next 280,000 years. And that's next door. So the grand scale of all of that helps me go. Probably the thing I'm sweating over doesn't matter. <laughs> wow. That's not useless. No, but I love that. I mean, it's, it's useless a, to it's know a, those distances and facts of a thing. It's that, a like, lot of random numbers and, and things that you know, but I yeah. don't feel like that's useless. Well, I somehow it needs to be something dumb and weird. Like what's yours? All right. Your foot. Yep. It's that distance. Really? Yeah. Your foot's from your elbow to your wrist? Uh-huh. No. You have, I'm short, you have short little feet? You have little feet? I'm testing this when we get off this podcast. You have little Brent's feet because you got short form. short forms. Mm. I'm a nine with a thick pair of socks. Over a 13. <laughs> thick, <laughs> thick pair of socks. <laughs> I'm a nine and I got these gumby ass looking arms. Mm-hmm. That's a random useless fact. That's a pretty Completely good one. Well, I, useless. I've taken a lot of useless facts and then figured out how to translate them into a thing that uh, either oh, stresses me out likes. or, or helps me. <laughs> or, yeah. Or does the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like one, one would be like those shots of earth from space. A lot of space stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you see earth for, for those who believe we're operating on a ball. Yep. Uh, I do. Yep. Uh, you have a thing that's 18,000 miles in diameter. Yep. Uh, or radius. One of those two. It's big. Um, <laughs> But our atmosphere, like if you leave Earth and just go up, it's like mm. 25 miles. Yep. To space. Yep. That is all the breathable air that we have forever in the universe. And we just fucking put chemicals in it. Yeah. <laughs> We're like, this is fine. We'll deal with that later. Like, it's a bit. 25, 25 miles. 25 of, miles. Of like, yo, you, like yeah. when they leave on the, the shuttle, yep. mm -hmm. they're in orbit in like 12 minutes. Yeah. That's, it is un not a long that's time. uncomfortably quick. Yeah. 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 And, oh, then, yeah. and then the way, another fact that I like is uh, the way gravity works yep. in space. Um, there isn't a such thing as like zero gravity. Mm -hmm. There's being an orbit. Yep. That's the only time zero gravity exists. If you just leave directly away from the thing, the next celestial body of the bigger size has the gravity. Yep. And you're always going to be pulled. Whereas the reason when you're orbiting that you're weightless is because you're traveling around the thing at the same speed because it's round, it falls away from you. So you're just constantly falling because you're doing 18 or 20,000 miles an hour, which is also the problem of why all these weird nuts and bolts and weird things that are floating around also Space in orbit junk. are traveling at that speed that goes straight through stuff. I love how deep this got. So many space it facts. It is so good. Yeah. It is so, so many good. Space There's facts. All right. Facts. So like two more, two more quick fire ones. Okay. <laughs> what would be the worst buy one, get one free sale of all time? Circumcision. One, A circumcision. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you get the second half free. Oh no. <laughs> That's a really fucking weird thing. Circumcisions? Oh yeah. yeah. The yes, fact that, that our society is oh man, it's we one have of my, a whole other podcast. One of my favorite it's lines, and I've I've so done it at a couple speaking things. And I'm a I'm not the biggest fan of the capital G God mm -hmm. that 
you know, the Roman Catholic yep. God idea. Um, and so one of my favorite ways that like hit that audience with a like, wait, is like, you know, God created us perfect in his image that we are ready to go. And that's why people get weird about tattoos or yep. get weird about changes because God made you perfect. Yep. Except baby dicks. Mm. Baby dicks are ugly and we have to fix those immediately. <laughs> Like, why it's, do we do that? Like, what have we convinced ourselves of this fucking genital mutilation yeah. in our society that we don't treat as that? Yep. And there's no founded medical nope. fucking benefit. Nope. And if it's female genital mutilation. Oh. Yeah. Absolutely fucking not. Oh, absolutely fucking not. The side not, effects okay. and percentage risk of fucking circumcisions going bad on kids isn't exactly zero. No, it's mind blowing. They, I thank my wife every day for introducing me to the research. Yeah. Mind blowing. It's like, crazy. It's blowing. crazy and then, that we just casually do this. And then, of course, a very American thing of we'll continue to do this. But what if my son sees he's different? How about hold a fucking conversation? Yeah, totally. Instead of chop his dick up? Yeah. It's so weird. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. It's so weird. <clears throat> what? I mean, as a, as a cut dude. Yeah. I don't have any complaints about my gear. Yeah. But. It's a fucking silly thing that we do that we've decided as a society that that's cool, but the other stances we take don't add up to being like circumcision. <laughs> that should be a norm. I'm going to have another podcast someday that's just like these deep conversations of things that like really, because I've learned a lot, you know, having yeah. four and a half folks. My wife, you know, is an absolute champion of like a lot of stuff and it's mind blowing to me. What like is accepted as normal as like the paradigm that exists, mm -hmm. and it's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. So what? Uh, what would be the oh, worst Bible get one? Fill for you? Mammograms. Man. <laughs> Fucking <laughs> terrible. So painful to have no titties, and they're like, we're gonna smush those down into a flat little crepe. Terrible. Also divorce. Oh yes. <laughs> also a terrible thing. There's lots like some lawyer is like, buy one. I do the next one half off. These are the Fuck. best answers ever. So one more. So Bonnie, Oof. if Matt was arrested with no explanation, what would you assume that he had done? Drugs. Yeah. Drugs. <laughs> Something like Hundred percent the yeah. answer. Yeah. If Bonnie was arrested with no explanation, what would you assume she had done? I would have to probably also assume. I don't know. Drugs. Sorry it's maybe that. drugs, but then like. But that would be because I was with you. Bonnie. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Like what is Bonnie, like if I just got a phone call and it's like hey Bonnie. yeah Bonnie and Dana were out somewhere oh, and got arrested together the two of them together yeah. where do I have to guess speeding in a car some type of trespassing in the woods or probably trying to like something with animals yeah yeah we we're probably like trying oh, to rescue an animal oh you guys were animal. trying to pet a bison <laughs> yeah yes yes you made a friend with a bison and then the the park rangers. If it's arrested. Dana and I, yeah, that's yeah. there's probably one of those things. They're reintroducing bison to uh, Glacier yeah. next month. Hell oh. yeah. They're uh, oh, releasing cool. a herd of 75 on the reservation with free roam to go into Glacier. So wow, bison that's might so come cool. Back Man, I'm really glad knowing that if I got a phone call and it was like, Bonnie got arrested. I know you didn't like Do randomly wrong. stab a person no. out of no. anger. Like I know that that's not. It was me trying to rescue an animal yeah. who yeah. probably has a nice safe home. And yeah. I'm like, you come with yeah. All right. So this is my favorite question. And I actually am excited to ask both of you this. So from my experience and now knowing you better, Bonnie, I feel like both of your moral compasses are cemented in and as straight as they can be. And there's some wiggle room. No, I, I, I see from like the authenticity, the grace, the, the self-awareness, the right intentions, like there's not sure. an ill bone in the body. And so this is a question I ask everybody. And so Let's go back and how long we've we been going? 90? Uh, yeah, we're right around no. hour 40. So let's go back and delete an hour and 40 minutes and forget that anybody heard anything that we said. And you have the opportunity in this moment to tattoo something on their soul permanently. Bonnie, what words of wisdom would you <clears throat> tattoo on their soul? Self-love does not mean self-complacency. Mm. That's an amazing, amazing quote. And Matt? Mine's longer. Go for it's, it. It's a bit wordier. Uh, Mine has to do with time. Like mm -hmm. that's my big driving thing. Yeah. It's the one that I can't turn off. Uh, and it, it, it really stemmed uh, when my father had passed. Um, you know, he uh, died uh, the day before I turned 32. Uh, sorry, I turned 31 on April 6th in 2014. And he died April 5th um, from pancreatic cancer and finally uh, shot himself. Mm -hmm. um, just into the fight, right? 
cancer killed my dad. Yep. Bullet wasn't. Yep. Whatever. Um, and so at that moment, like I just had that feeling of like, oh, I'm halfway. Yep. That halfway. And what that equals, you know, that's 1,612 weeks. Right? That's fucking nothing. Nothing. It's nothing. And so if I had this big jar on my table and it's got 1,612 marbles in it and every Monday I pluck one out and I take a minute to say, did I spend this out of obligation with people that I didn't really want to be around doing shit I don't love, not setting my soul on fire? Or did I chasing things I love, trying to become a better person, trying to become better aware, trying to handle things with more empathy, trying to create and do more good and leave bigger ripples in the pond for when my time is up. Either way, the marble goes in the fucking trash can. Mm. It isn't special and you're not a fucking martyr for riding it out. Mm -hmm. The only thing we have are those days left. And I don't know when X or how many marbles I get, but I know I'll make the most of mine. Yep. I, uh, I have nothing to add to that. We're going to mic drop both of those in this current moment. Uh, so for everybody listening, uh, we're going to wrap the show. I'm going to tell you where to find them because you're going to go to hate brands, which is H V I I I brands.com. Check them out on Instagram. You'll see Matt's Instagram, Matt Vincent. Bonnie, what's your last name again? Schroeder. You can find me at Bonstro. Bonstro. That's what I thought it was. And then someone think it was Henry the eighth. Oh, Henry VIII. Hey, we're, <laughs> we're bougie here. We're royalty. Yeah, if you do like uh, hate.com is a Henry VIII oh, website. Yeah. So Amazing. Uh, for everybody listening, what I want you to do is send one of us or all of us a DM on Instagram with your biggest takeaway. Uh, do you like it? Do you have any other questions? Like, let's expand on it. Check them out for sure. And here's the thing. Don't let anything said here become shelf help. Take one thing, put it into practice and keep going because this thing was loaded uh, we'll call them golden nuggets as my buddy, the biz bros call them, but it was absolutely loaded with nuggets and wisdom. And the one thing I will say is that it's only good if you put it into practice. So take a listen, listen again and implement it right away. And so this has been another episode of the mind of George show. Thank you both for being here. Thanks, man. Thank you. It's been stoked. We have one more thing to do, but I'm going to avoid a UTI and go pee before we do it. <laughs> so for all of you listening, it's time to cue the intro and we'll see you or you'll hear me in your earballs in the next episode.